If you want to have a lovely chat with a stranger on an airplane or in the park, usually a dog story or two will start the conversation rolling. Dr. Stanley Corrin tells great dog stories. He loves, studies, and writes about canines and their peculiarities. His most recent book is called Born to Bark. Dr. Corrin is a rabid researcher who teaches psychology at UBC. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Stanley Corrin back to Studio 4 to tell us more. I didn't mean you were rabid. Just meant you were enthusiastic. Oh, I thought you said rabbit. <laughs> oh, no. I said rabid. <laughs> Play on words, perhaps. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I look at your body of work, and we were trying to figure this out in the green room, how many books you really have written? Well, Ninety-some. No. <laughs> Not, I mean, I've written about 56 books, but, uh, but a lot of them, uh, most people in the real world are not going to see. They're designed for either their textbooks uh, or their books for instructors or uh, their uh, scientific uh, treatises, uh, monographs and that sort of thing. So uh, Eyes glazing over on that one. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it, it, it all have to do with the research. You know, you've you got to remember that, that for uh, close to 40 years, uh, I was, you know, up to there in research, and the vast majority of that research was uh, neuropsychological research, and, um, you know, I felt I had a message mm -hmm. I wanted to carry out, and, and in between I was shoehorning in all the sort of wonderful stuff which I wanted to do on dogs, and so we were starting to do the dog research, and, uh, uh, and then, you know, I've done about, you know, 10, 11 books on dogs. Uh, and people's relationship to dogs and that yes. kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. But when you were a young lad in Philadelphia, I thought you wanted to be an astronaut. I, well, it, it, it's really true. I mean, you know, it, it, was that, it was that time. They had just, you know, were just put up Sputnik, and it was presumed that anybody who was going to university was either going to be, you know, a uh, physicist, an astrophysicist, or an engineer, or mm -hmm. some sort of rocket scientist, and of course, you know that that's the way my parents were pushing me. I mean, you know, they didn't want me to be a you know a psychologist. I mean, at that point in time, you mentioned psychology; they thought Freud. My mother would say, "No, no, you, you don't want all that sex stuff." No, no, no. <laughs> go, go over to the Carl Jung side or do something. But but the point is, the Cold War was rocketing right along, and yep. we were trying to beat the Russians. Yep. Well, the United States was trying to beat the Russians to space, all of that, yep. back and forth. But they put two dogs into space before they put humans. That's right. They put two dogs. Their names were Strelka and Belka. Uh, and they were the first uh, animals uh, uh, to orbit the Earth and to return safely. And uh, it, it, there's a fascinating connection. Um, it turns out that Nikita Khrushchev was then um, uh, the head of Russia, and uh, as the Cold War was pretty bad, it was just coming off of the Cuban Missile mm -hmm. Crisis and all that sort of nonsense. And so as a peace gesture, because he knew that, that the Kennedy household was filled with dogs, uh, Khrushchev gave him this little white dog called Pishinka. And Pushinka's uh, claim to fame was that she was the daughter of Strelka, and she had been born after the space flight. So Kennedy used to refer to her as the Pupnik, uh, as opposed <laughs> to Sputnik. Uh, right. Anyway, um, and now the CIA and the people at Secret Service and all that were petrified. They thought, you know, the dog has to have some sort of receiver in it to sort of monitor White House. Con and they were going to take this dog off and have it killed in autopsy to go check. Really? For so they thought the dog was a plant. Exactly. And so uh, Kennedy said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, this was a peace offering. You don't go ahead and, <laughs> and, and dissect a peace offering. Uh, so they took it to uh, Walter Reed uh, Hospital and had the dog x-rayed and gave it a sonograph. And the thermograph was a brand new thing at that time. And right. you scanned it, and all they found inside was puppy stuff. So, oh, that's good. <laughs> so the White House dog went to Walter Reed, yes, along right. with all the presidents. Hey, you got it. Of you, course. You got it, mm -hmm. right. So uh, recently uh, in The Sun, there was a, uh, a great series on what dogs mean uh, to us as therapy dogs. Yep. All of that, they can uh, make us happier, calmer. Well, the research in this is really quite interesting. Um, you know, it was back in the early 1980s. I mean, everybody sort of knew. I mean, Sigmund Freud even talked about the fact that uh, uh, if he had his dog uh, Joffy, she was a chow chow, in the room with him, uh, 
then kids found it easier to talk, and some depressed people found it easier to talk. Uh, but uh, two interesting characters, a psychologist by the name of Alan Beck and a psychiatrist by the name of Aaron Katcher, decided to test this. So what they did was they, they took people and they basically brought a dog into, into the lab and they had people pet the dog. And if it was a familiar, friendly dog, in fact, they found that the heart rate slowed the breathing became more reg regular, the blood pressure dropped. In other words, you saw all of the signs of de-stressing and follow-up things showed that in fact some of the stress hormones like the corticosteroids uh, were much reduced in the blood. And so they said, okay, you know, this is a major uh, de-stressor. Now there's a wonderful uh, gal by the name of um, Elaine Friedman yeah. Uh, from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And she said, I mean, she, she took the next logical step. Uh, since we know that one of the major contributors to heart problems is stress, she looked at a whole bunch of men who were 55 and above who had had their first heart attack and then followed them up for about four years and found that you were seven times more likely to be alive um, at the end of that four-year period if you owned a pet. Really? And a cat or a dog? Well, or it, yeah, specifically it, it, a dog. It was it, the dog was seven times. Okay, there was benefit from a cat, but not as much, uh, and um, uh, but it was still a positive effect. Mm -hmm. And uh, her argument was that it has to do with the social interaction and the stress release, which you get. Uh, from, from owning the dog. Sure, and of course you have to walk the dog. You don't have to walk the cat. Well, that's, I mean, that was one of the arguments which people said, you know, they said it's just the exercise thing. But mm -hmm. in fact, you know, some of these people, uh, you know, she's done follow-up studies. I mean, once you, once you have a terrific finding like that, you know, you sort of tease it apart to try to see what all the, you know, where all the screws sure. are tightened. Um, and uh, she found that, you know, some people have tiny little Yorkshire Terriers who don't really get walked. They get let out on the patio or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it still had the benefit. Of course, and if you talk to life partners or uh, uh, wives, they will tell you that they think the dogs are first and they're second. Well, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting sort of thing because uh, there was a paper which appeared in uh, one of the legal journals, I think it was a law review, uh, which looked at divorce rates amongst people who, uh, amongst couples who own dogs versus those who don't. And they found the divorce rates were lower. And their argument is, you know, you, 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 you had a really ratty day in, at, at work and you come in uh, to the house and you need some TLC, uh, but your partner has had this really ratty day. So if you try to demand some affection, mm -hmm. it's going to start a fight. But on the other hand, there's Lassie going, let me, let me, let me, let me. And, you know, and so you pet the dog, you feel better. Uh, you the don't, dog doesn't you, talk back. That's right. And you don't nudge your partner. And, mm -hmm. and so the, there's no cumulative buildup of, of uh, you know, any sort of antipathy. And so the marriage goes on. Well, sure. And if you have border collies, they mind. <laughs> <laughs> right? Says a border collie Says owner. Says a border collie because they are at the top of your intelligence that's right. list, I mean, right? Well, For working dogs, how does that work? And what, what we did there is uh, uh, we went ahead and contacted every single dog obedience judge in uh, the U.S. and Canada. And uh, we reasoned that these are the people who are looking at dogs under standardized conditions and seeing just how well they perform. And it's, it's sort of a test of school learning. It's not native smarts. It's not your instinctive ability to herd or retrieve or that right. sort of thing. Um, and uh, we were extremely lucky. Uh, 209 uh, judges filled out a really huge uh, survey instrument. And that's more than half of all the judges in, in the North American continent. And, um, and they came out with the fact, uh, it turns out that 199 out of 209 judges put the Border Collie in the top 10. So, really? I mean, that if we could get that kind of consistency on any other measure, mm -hmm. it would be astonishing. Exactly. But Border Collie, then the Poodle, large or small, or did they look at that? Like standard uh, Poodle, it, 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 toy Poodle? It was the uh, miniature and the uh, standard were lumped together because mm -hmm. at that time they were still being lumped together in, in the uh, American Kennel Club. Uh, and then it was the uh, German Shepherd and the Golden Retriever. 
Uh, the Doberman was number five. The Little Shetland Sheepdog was number six, and number seven was the Lab. So there are re there are three retrievers in the in the mm -hmm. in the top seven over there, uh, and retrievers. Uh, 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 poodles are retriever. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, Don't tell the poodle lovers. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. They the poodle didn't ask for the hair, haircut. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but um, uh, well, they were rambunctious poodles. They're smart. Oh they yeah, I, oh they really are. I was, I was, and playful and I was uh, out uh, a few years back uh, at the National Retriever Trials, which were being held at uh, in Lethbridge in in Alberta, and uh, and I'm lying about the numbers because I don't remember the specific thing. But right. let's look at sort of the working certificate, which is the first level of retrieving. Uh, there were there were ten, roughly ten qualifying dogs, and nine of them were black labs, and one of them was this. This, this 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 gorgeous standard poodle, uh, white, <laughs> right. named Lucy, and all the good old boys are going, rrr, rrr, what's happening to our sport? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Well, is there a dog that is better surviving on its own, a breed, a specific breed? Do you know what I mean? Usually dogs <coughs> need to be fed and watered and all no. of that. They don't kill mice. Is there a dog that's just really smart that way? or? Well... What you want, if, if, if your dog's going to be left alone quite mm -hmm. a bit, first of all, you want a dog who doesn't bore easily. Because, you know, if you've got a dog who, who gets bored, then he's going to entertain himself. He's going to entertain himself by destroying your, your, mm -hmm. your furniture. Or, sure. Uh, your what, shoes. You, exactly. Um, so you, you want a dog who's not necessarily in the top ten. I mean, right. you know, a bulldog is like third from the bottom. Uh, and... Um, you know, and they're nice, placid dogs. Mm -hmm. The other thing you want is a low activity level. So, um, so if you, if if I, if I have a Doberman, you know, and my my lifestyle keeps me out of the house for you know ten uh, hours a day or something like that, you know, my Ming Vaz collection is going to get wiped out when I'm gone because mm -hmm. he's going to be looking for entertainment. But if I have a bulldog, you know, it's going to take him eight hours to figure out that I'm gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, when I show up, here's this dog, this very pleasant mm -hmm. personality and a real sweetheart. And he goes, oh, yep, I'm here. I'm oh, yep, for you. I'm here. <laughs> I didn't uh, destroy the, uh, the Ming vase. Yeah. And, but I, I guess if a dog was smart enough, he could turn a water faucet on, doubt it. Uh, let's hope that they don't learn that. I mean, the, you know, <laughs> we had to install uh, safety catches in our, mm -hmm. in our uh, house. Uh, for all of the uh, ground level uh, cabinetry because the combination of young grandchildren um, mm -hmm. who are getting into it and then the dogs watch and figure out how to get sure. into it uh, was just disastrous. So, I mean, I don't want them, you know, turning on the, uh, uh, faucet. the water faucet. No, that wouldn't be good. Dr. Stanley Corrin, our guest. Uh, How to Speak Dog, one of his books, The Paw Prince of History, his latest one, Born to Bark, and The Paw Prince of History coming out in paperback. If just it's out. not yep. just out in paperback. Good. We'll come back.